Uh, we're going to be entering into our time uh, reading uh, God's Word this morning, and our reading comes from John chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30. And since I believe that these words have been breathed out by the Holy Spirit, and it would have the same authority as if Jesus himself were speaking them to us on this stage this morning, I want to invite you to please stand with me as a way of showing honor and respect to God's Word. Please listen now to the words of Jesus. He says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. And I and the Father are one. These are the words of our Lord, and I believe that what he says is true. Would you pray with me one more time? God, we bless this time together. We bless the reading of your word, and we ask that as I share with you, share with my friends here what, I, what you have laid on my heart, that God, whatever is of me, my friends here could forget. But God, whatever is of you, that they could hold on to, that they could remember, and that they could p- apply to their lives. And so, Lord, we ask that this time, this morning, that you would receive all the glory and all the praise. We love you, and we thank you, and it's in your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> he rebelled. He did not conform. And so a revolution was born. In the year 167 BC, in a small village in the Judean countryside, a humble Jewish priest made a profound act of defiance that would change history forever. His name was Mattathias, and he was living in Israel at a time in which the Hebrew way of life was completely under attack. You see, in those days, Israel was under the rule of the Seleucid Empire, or the Syrian Empire, and for a number of years, Jews had begun adopting the culture of this Greek empire, a process known of as Hellenization. And for many Jews, this was disturbing to see some of their old customs and old ways infiltrated with Greek influence, but for the most part, they remain, remained very civil because this empire permitted them to practice their religion in peace. However, this freedom did not last because in 175 B.C., a new king assumed the throne. He went by the name Antichus Epiphanes, which literally means God made manifest, or God in the flesh. However, many people knew him by a slight variation of that nickname, Epimanes, which means the madman. And this madman king made it his mission to complete Hellenization in Israel by actively exterminating Judaism from the region. He forbid key Jewish practices such as observing the Sabbath and circumcision, and perhaps worst of all, he had the temple in Jerusalem converted into a temple of the Greek god Zeus, dedicating the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar, which was deeply offensive to the Jews and would be known of as, uh, from then on out, as the abomination of desolation. Which brings us back to Mattathias. In his small town, this Jewish priest was commanded by Seleucid officials to make a sacrifice to the Greek gods. As a deeply orthodox Jew, Mattathias refused, and when someone else tried to make the sacrifice for him, in a pit of rage, he killed him and the official and then destroyed the pagan altar. Knowing the consequences of his actions, Mattathias and his five sons fled into the nearby mountains and began to organize a revolt against the Hellenization of their Hebrew culture. Soon, Mattathias died, and so command of the rebels was given to his son, Judah, 
who, like the erratic king, had a nickname, Judah Maccabee, the hammer of Israel. How cool is that? The hammer of Israel. And so for the next few years, Judah led what was a ragtag group into a full-scale revolt, using guerrilla tactics to win a variety of battles with the Seleucids and slowly but surely win back the countryside to Judaism by destroying Greek altars and forcefully reinstating Jewish practices. And his greatest victory came in 164, when Judah led his forces into Jerusalem and took control of the city. Once he was in control, he immediately began to cleanse the temple, destroying the pagan idols that had been put up inside it, as well as restoring the sacred Jewish Jewish object called the menorah. This golden seven-branched candlestick was supposed to be kept Uh, lit all the time, but its fire had been extinguished under the Greek rule. And so Judah reignited it, but since the temple had been completely pillaged, there was only enough oil to keep the candle lit for one night. But as legend has it, the candles burned bright for eight full days, which was considered by Judah and the Jews to be a miracle from God. Unfortunately, the war was far from over, and four years later, Judah would lose his life in battle. However, his descendants and his followers would continue the struggle and eventually would lead Israel to independence in 134. And so the Maccabean Revolution became a treasured part of Jewish history and tradition, resulting in the establishment of the Feast of Dedication, or the Festival of Lights, or as we probably more commonly know of it as today, Hanukkah, the day in which Jews remember the second dedication of the temple and the miracle of the menorah's light. And the reason why I share all of this today is to set the stage for what is going to be happening in the 10th chapter of John. As Jesus was going to be heading to Jerusalem to celebrate the holiday of Hanukkah. And at this point in his ministry, this one man named Jesus has stirred the pot big time when it comes to these first century Jews. He has been controversial for the things he has done. The book of John is known uh, is known for the seven major miracles that Jesus performs in it six of which we've already covered in this series. And some of these miracles have been controversial because of when Jesus performed them. He healed, he did works on the Sabbath, the one day that he was not supposed to do anything at all. He didn't play by the rules of the establishment. But he also has caused controversy by the things he has said. In addition to the signs that Jesus performs, the book of John is also known of Uh, known for the seven I am statements that Jesus makes. Seven illustrations that Jesus uses to describe himself. And we covered these statements in a different series back in 2020, but uh, and so we haven't looked too much at them during this series of John, but they are helpful uh, in building the context uh, because the statements that Jesus makes and the miracles that he performs often go hand in hand. So for instance... In John chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000 people by multiplying bread and then turns around later on in that chapter and says, I am the bread of life. Or in chapter 8, Jesus tells us that he is the light of the world. And then right after in chapter 9, he brings light by restoring the sight of a blind man. Now, as we turn to chapter 9, you might notice that it begins with Jesus taking two more Uh, excuse me, turn to chapter 10, you might notice that it begins with Jesus making two more I am statements, both of which would have particularly resonated with people living in a predominantly agricultural society. If you lived in a small Jewish village, it was normal for you to have four to six sheep who would live in a small walled courtyard outside your house. And because each family only owned a few sheep, you couldn't really justify hiring a full-time shepherd. And so what families would do is families in the area and the neighborhood would come together. 
they would pool their money and they would hire a full-time shepherd to take care of all their sheep. Early each morning, the shepherd, which was usually a son from one of the families, would go from home to home. What is interesting is the close connection that would exist between the shepherd and his sheep. The sheep would know the shepherd. More specifically, they would know the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd, uh, upon hearing the shepherd's voice, the sheep would run to him and they would follow him as he led the sheep out into the pasture, into the countryside to graze. And not only would the sheep know the shepherd, but the shepherd would also know the sheep, even by name. To them, this herd of sheep wouldn't be just this mass of white fluff that it would be to me, right? Each sheep would have a name, a personality, something that the shepherd would know. It's pretty incredible if you think about it. And it's with this in mind that Jesus makes some important statements about himself. First, he declares that I am the door of the sheep. The door was the right way to access the sheep inside the courtyard. Only a thief would try to come into the courtyard through a different means. In the same way, I think what Jesus is saying by this is that he is the right way to access the Father and thereby the truth. It's only through Jesus that we can access God. And secondly, he says, I am the good shepherd in verse 14. Like a good shepherd, Jesus knows his sheep, his people. But even more than that, he is our great defender, willingly laying down his life to protect the flock he loves. And so it's in the context of these two statements that will, that will kind of help us inform or help inform us of the dialogue and in turn the controversy that's going to brew for us today. So with that being said, let's get into our passage uh, this morning. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab that or maybe a Bible app on your phone and turn with me to John chapter 10. And we're going to start things off in verse 22. Go ahead and look at it with me. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So John begins by setting the stage, giving us the time and the place. And he's done this before. He's told us the context in which Jesus is ministering. He's mentioned other feasts like the Feast of the Passover or the Festival of Booths. And one thing that you can learn from Jewish culture is that they really like to party. They love to eat because they're always having feasts. They're always celebrating something new. And as we talked about at the beginning, this specific festival is what we know of as Hanukkah. Jesus goes to Jerusalem to celebrate Hanukkah. But when he gets there, he isn't greeted with a happy Hanukkah, but rather with a pointed question about his identity. How long will you keep us in suspense, Jesus? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, they say. You know, in our story last week, Jesus healed a man born blind. And when he found this man later on in the chapter, he asked him if he wanted to believe in the Christ. And this man responded very genuinely. He wanted to believe in, who, in the Christ. He just needed Jesus to reveal the Christ to him, which Jesus said, I am the one, I am he who you're speaking to. And so in some sense, <clears throat> a very similar thing is happening here. This crowd is asking Jesus to reveal the Christ. Are you the Christ, Jesus? But from what we can tell, unlike the blind man, their motive isn't genuine, but rather it's sinister. They want Jesus to reveal himself as the Messiah so that they can indict him of blasphemy. They want to catch him red-handed, so to speak. They're setting Jesus up in order to trap him. 
They claim that Jesus is keeping them in suspense, or as it could be translated, they find his ambiguity surrounding his identity to be annoying. But what do we know? We know that so far in this gospel, Jesus hasn't been keeping any secrets about who he thinks he is. He hasn't been shy about it. He revealed himself in chapter 9 as the son of man to the man born blind. A conversation that the Pharisees overheard. He has clearly said that God has entrusted him with judgment and that he has the ability to raise the dead, which are divine attributes. The Pharisees, for quite some time, have been planning to kill him. Since they understand that he believed that he was equal with God. And in chapter 8, Jesus boldly declared, before Abraham was, I am. Which again, isn't bad grammar, but is rather a hint at the I am uh, name for God. A name that God used for himself in the Old Testament. And it resulted in the crowd trying to kill him, because they knew what Jesus was saying. And this is only to name a few instances. Jesus isn't keeping secrets. He's already spoken plainly. And so how is he going to respond now? Well, let's keep reading. Look at verse 25. It says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe, that the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe, because you are not a part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. These Jews want Jesus to speak plainly to them. And Jesus asks them, where have you been? Have you been living under a rock? Well, that's my translation anyway. I've told you plainly. I haven't been keeping secrets. And even more so, I haven't just told you, but I've shown you. I've revealed it to you by my works. You know, it reminds me of his response to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison, and uh, he have, he's having some doubts about Jesus, and so he sends some messengers to Jesus, and they ask him, are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? And what's really interesting is that Jesus doesn't answer yes or no, but rather he says this. He says, the blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, look around you. The evidence is here. The proof is in the pudding. Look at what I've done. But then Jesus, after responding to these Jews, makes a very pointed accusation. He says, despite the evidence, despite the proof, These Jews haven't believed because they are not his sheep. And he's again pointing back to that illustration he used earlier in the chapter, specifically Jesus as the good shepherd. And remember, the shepherd has a special connection to the sheep, to the point that they will come running to him if they hear his voice. And this is how it is with his sheep, with his followers and his disciples, Jesus is saying, that they listen to his voice and they follow him. But this crowd that he is addressing is not of his flock. And since Jesus is of God, what Jesus is in turn saying is that they are not of God. They are sheep from a different pasture who have a different shepherd. And as Jesus has hinted at elsewhere, this shepherd is not a good shepherd, but is rather the devil himself. It's an eerie thing to think about. It's kind of hard to wrap our minds around it, but I think it explains the hurdle that some have when it comes to following Christ. Because when you've been conditioned and when you've been trained to listen to the voice of your own sinful desires, and really the voice of the, that's enhanced by the voice of the devil, who the Bible calls a liar, a thief, and a murderer, It can be hard to break out of that and follow the voice of Christ, the Good Shepherd. For instance, if you've been conditioned all your life to eat whatever you want, it can be hard to start a diet. 
Or if you've been conditioned to sit on the couch and watch TV day after day after day, it can be hard to start working out. And if you've been conditioned to never say no to a sinful impulse or never say yes to obedience to the gospel, it can be hard to hear the voice that's calling you to break free. And so if the voice of the good shepherd is calling you to go where you don't want to go, to go somewhere that's against all natural impulses, that can be a difficult shift to make. Because sometimes the first step of obedience is the hardest step to take. Because it goes against the grain of everything you've ever known, everything you've ever been conditioned to believe. Moving from the false shepherd to the good shepherd is difficult. But when you make the decision to give your life to Christ, you are drawn by his voice, Jesus says. And this isn't to say that the devil's not ever going to try to lead you astray or that you're never going to wrestle with your own sinful impulses. But the more you become conditioned to hear the voice of the master, the easier it is to follow him. When you can say no to a more minor temptation, the easier it is to say no to a bigger temptation. And when you can say yes to a small step of obedience the easier it is to say yes to a larger step of obedience. But the hardest step to take in obedience is always that first step. But once you're in the shepherd's pasture, once you're in the good shepherd's sheep pen, you're in for good. Because listen to what Jesus says next. Look at verse 28. He says, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. <clears throat> to the sheep in his pasture, to the people who are of him, Jesus promises the gift of life. And back in verse 10, in chapter 10, Jesus promises life in the form of abundant life. In other words, upon conversion, we are offered and given new life on earth. The Holy Spirit begins the transforming work in your heart. And as you walk and step with the Spirit, your life changes for the better. As you grow to be more and more like Christ. This is called sanctification. This is a part of the new life, the adoption into Christ's family. But now we see the other kind of life that Jesus offers. Uh, not just abundant life, but also eternal life. The promise is life, both life, uh, a life redeemed here on earth, but also a life everlasting in heaven with him. And as we touched on two weeks ago, you can't just receive a new life and then lose it. You can't just be promised eternal life and then have it taken away. Jesus holds us firmly in his hand, as does the Father, who can't be out-muscled by anyone. No vicious wolf or greedy, <clears throat> excuse me, no vicious wolf or greedy robber can overtake the grip of the Father. <clears throat> this is the blessed assurance we sang of at the beginning of the service, right? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. In Christ you are an heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Colossians 3.3 3 says that you have died to yourself and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You are deeply embedded in the protecting grip of God through salvation found in Jesus Christ. There is no greater security than that found in true salvation. But in order to receive this salvation secured by the Father, you need to first believe in His Son. And it's this part that really trips people up. Look at verse 30. <clears throat> Jesus says, I and the Father are one. 
The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. The Jews want Jesus to speak plainly, and so he does. In chapter 8, the climax of the passage is Jesus, uh, his statement in verse uh, 50, 58. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in this passage, we see something similar. As the passage kind of reaches the height, the climax, with Jesus declaring, I and the Father are one. Both statements point to Jesus' divinity, and both statements elicit violent reactions. Namely, people picking up stones to try to kill Jesus with. But interestingly, Jesus confronts this reaction by asking them why. Specifically, he wants to know what he's done wrong that would make them want to kill him. Because even though they would, they, even though, even they would have to admit that Jesus has done nothing wrong, right? In fact, he's done a lot of good. He's done many miracles among the people, all of which have been kind and generous, right? You can't be mad at Jesus for healing the sick. But obviously they aren't upset about the things he has done or that he's been doing, but rather they are upset by the things he has been saying. They accuse him of blasphemy because Jesus has made it clear that he thinks he's God. And if this isn't true, According to the Jewish law, he's worthy of death. They like what Jesus does, but they don't like what he says. And I can't help but see a connection between their situation and our culture and world today. As a culture, there's a lot we like about Jesus. People love the idea of Jesus. He represents to many the values of kindness, and love and the way that he treated people, right? Everyone can get on board with the way Jesus treated children, the poor, the oppressed, and women. And even though not everyone believes Jesus had the ability to supernaturally heal, everyone is okay with the concept of a guy improving the state of the suffering. Everyone likes the idea of Jesus. But when you really look at who Jesus was. That can be a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people. Not everyone can handle that side of Jesus. You like Jesus until you read the part where he goes into the temple and flips over tables and makes a whip and is yelling at people. Or you like Jesus until you read the part where he calls out a sin that you're struggling with. Or when he says something that makes you uncomfortable. When he addresses something that conflicts with the way that you're living your life. Or you like Jesus until you hear his claim that he believes he's God. As the theologian C.S. Lewis has said, you can't simply say that you like Jesus because he was a good moral teacher who had good ideas and did good things. Because his ministry and Jesus' words are controversial and are even radical to the point that Lewis argues that Jesus can only be one of three things. He's either an outright liar, uh, intentionally deceiving people into thinking he's God. He's either a lunatic, a crazy person who thinks he's God. Or he is who he says he is. The Lord of heaven and earth. And so what these Jews are accusing of uh, Jesus of is true. He is absolutely claiming to be God. But they are wrong to accuse him of blasphemy. Because when Jesus says this, he is absolutely correct. Because even though they like what he does and not what he says, both things, both what Jesus does and what he says, point to him being the Christ. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 34. <clears throat> Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? 
If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him who the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. The way Jesus responds to this is admittedly kind of confusing. And I think Jesus meant for it to be a little confusing. In order to, to get a clue about what Jesus is saying, you need to understand the passage he is quoting. Namely Psalm 82, which says, I said you are gods and you are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere mortals. <clears throat> you will fall like every other ruler. But in order to get a clue about Psalm 82, you need to understand what the psalmist is referencing here. Specifically the encounter between Moses and God in Mount Sinai. You know, you remember maybe that, that God, the time that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and the law. And after doing so, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai and he finds all the Israelites worshiping a golden calf, which in turn leads to uh, a good portion of them dying. The interpretation is that by saying that you are gods, God was telling Israel that if they received the law and if they lived by it, they would be holy as he was holy, a.k.a. they'd be like gods. However, because they messed up by worshiping idols, they died like mere mortals. And so all this is to say is that the argument that Jesus is making here is really witty and really theologically complex. If God called the ones uh, receiving the law gods, why should he, who has been sent uh, into the world by God, be charged with blasphemy by calling himself the Son of God? Again, it's a little confusing. Well, the reason why Jesus goes into this complex territory is hard to say, but honestly, I think the simplest answer is that he's causing a distraction. He's, he's give this angry crowd a moment of pause, a moment of confusion, during which Jesus can make another appeal to them. He says, if you aren't convinced by what I have said, look at what I've done. Look at the good and the miraculous things I've done and decide for yourself what that says about me. It's much like the blind man, what the blind man said from last week to the Pharisees. He encourages them to follow the logic. He says, look, only God can heal. God doesn't listen to sinners. Yet this man is healing in ways unseen of or unheard of before. What more evidence do you need to be convinced that this man is from God? But as we have seen before, not even his wondrous works are enough to keep this crowd from trying to seize him. They try to arrest him, but Jesus gets away. And if you notice in verse 39, there's almost a little bit of a play on words here. Those who are in Christ, Jesus has said before, will not be snatched out of the Father's hand. And Christ now was able to escape those who tried to snatch him into their hands. And really, friends, the irony here is that this man, Jesus, is rejected at another Jewish feast that he is the ultimate fulfillment of. As we said earlier, this was Hanukkah, a time to remember the revolution of Judah Maccabee. And at that time, the nation of Israel was being overtaken by a man who claimed to be manifested from God. But right now, in front of these Jews, was the one who was truly manifested from God, or God made flesh. The revolution started because a priest refused to sacrifice to pagan gods, a cause for which he and his sons would willingly give their lives. But Jesus would also willingly lay down his life not refusing to sacrifice himself as a way to save us from our sins. Judah Maccabee was the hammer of Israel, but it would be a hammer and nails that would pin Jesus to the cross. cross. 
And deeper still, the Feast of Dedication commemorated the second dedication and sanctification of the temple, the cleansing of the temple. But as the Jews celebrate the temple, they are unaware of how the temple points to Jesus. As Dia Carson puts it, a theologian puts it, the really critical sanctification, the crucial act of setting something or someone aside for God's exclusive use was the setting aside of the pre-incarnate Son to the work of the mission on which he was even then engaged. As Jesus would prophetically complain, uh, proclaim in, in John 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Jews at Hanukkah are focused on the sanctification of the temple when the true temple is standing right in front of them. Let's finish the passage. Look at verse 40. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there Jesus remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Jesus escapes the crowd. He's able to escape because of the reason that has been repeated uh, many times in John. Specifically, that his hour hasn't come yet. There's still more for him to do on earth. God still has a plan for him. Which leads us to where he goes next. The countryside. He goes back to where the ministry of John the Baptist had taken place. And his ministry there is fruitful with many people believing in him. But this is all setting the stage for the final sign, for the final miracle that Jesus is going to perform in John's gospel. And it's truly the grand finale. Let's pray together to end our time. God, we love you. We praise you. God, we thank you that you were not shy about who you thought you were. That you didn't just come to uh, be a teacher, to be a good moral philosopher, but you came to declare the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God was at hand. That you came to save your people from our sins. And God, we worship you, Jesus. We worship you knowing that you and the Father are one. And we lift high your name. And we thank you for the assurance that we have in you that you are the good shepherd, that you hold us firmly in your grip. And that when we are in you, cannot be led astray. We cannot be led out of the sheep pen. Lord, protect us from the, the voices that we still hear from the old life. Protect us from the temptations to sin. Protect us from the, the, the desires that we still have that uh, go against your will. God, help us to walk in line with you and with, your, with, the, uh, with you, Holy Spirit. God, we lift you high. We praise you and we thank you. And it's in your name we do pray. Amen.